In the beginning of the 1960s, I was working as a ship's doctor, as I recounted in previous chapter. But in 1962, I had emerged from the sea and reached dry land, and I was working as an assistant to a general practitioner in Norwich. Rather boring work, but it was a, it was a job. And uh, one morning in my office at Norwich, I was reading the Daily Telegraph, and I saw a story that uh, doctors in Saskatchewan were going on strike, and um, the government was looking for doctors from England to come and work during the strike. And so I thought, this looks very interesting. So I rang up Saskatchewan House, which is the sort of informal consulate that the, the province of Saskatchewan keeps in London. And I said, I'm a doctor, I, I want to volunteer. And he said, well, you know what you're letting yourself in for. It's going to be tough. I said, that's okay, I can take it. He said, well, if you're sure, I'll send you a ticket. And he sent me a ticket, and I was off to Canada. And so, boarded the plane in Heathrow in London, and off I went. And uh, in the middle of the flight, I fell asleep. And when I woke up, the um, flight attendant was announcing, we will very soon be landing in London. And I thought to myself, my God, the pilot has forgotten his passport and we're having to go back. But then discreet inquiries revealed that there was also a London in Canada. And uh, we landed there and we changed planes and eventually we arrived after another few hours flight in Regina, the capital of Saskatchewan. And there, two people were waiting, labels saying, awaiting Dr. Reynold Gold. And I went over to them and they explained that they were agents of the Saskatchewan government and they hustled me to a motel room and they said, don't leave here because there are spies out from the College of Physicians uh, waiting <coughs> to uh, entice you away. So if you need something to eat, go and order something at the restaurant there in the motel. And don't go anywhere else. Don't go ahead. And of course, we'll pay for the bill. And we'll come, and you come to collect you next morning. Now, I, should I want to leave it there and explain what had happened prior to the strike, which, of course, I didn't know yet but it will prepare you for what's going to greet me in a minute. So, until 1962, there had been no Medicare in Canada anywhere, except for a little area called Swift Current in Saskatchewan, where there was a sort of embryonic partial Medicare service, experimental. But when um, Tommy Douglas came to power in early 1962, he decided he would put in a Medicare service where the government would be a single payer and uh, give affordable Medicare to everybody. Because before, if you wanted medical care, you had to pay the doctor. Sometimes the doctors were very tolerant and very generous, and they would allow you to pay with a chicken or not pay at all. But you had to, uh, you had to have charity if you, if you were indigent. You either didn't get medical care at all, or you had to find charity, and that's also humiliating. And the doctors were very, very much against it, and they formed an organization called the Keep Our Doctors Organization. It's rather like a Trumpist organization. It's rather like the MAGA organization in America, a right-wing organization which claimed that the doctor was about to become a dictatorship and dictate what kind of medical care you were going to get and all the stories about if they thought you were a cost on the state, they, were ordered, they would order sort of suicide and all kinds of stories of this kind. And, uh, you know, in, the, in, in Saskatchewan, they take their politics very, very seriously. And families were split over this and, 
and uh, never spoke to each other again. And there were marches by the Kripa doctors and marches by the Labour Party, the, the government party, and it became pretty violent. So I was coming into a very, very t tense situation. So anyway, soon after the government agents left, sure enough, an agent from the Saskatchewan College of Physicians came to my room. They, they somehow discovered where I was staying. We must have had a good espionage organization. And he argued that I didn't understand the situation. The government was a very vicious government which was going to recruit the doctors as slaves to government policies and they were going to be very, it's going to be a very bad situation. He said, you probably have seen misleading government propaganda. Now, if you leave this strike breaking alone, we'll look after you and we'll get to see that you get a good practice when the strike is over. And I said, well, no. Um, I, I believe that Medicare is good for the people. This is my belief and I'm acting on my belief. And so the, he was very resigned and went away. So, well, next morning the government people picked me up, took me by car to the central government offices in, 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 in Regina and the first thing they did is they doled out 300 Canadian dollars to each of us. There were several of us strike breakers there. And uh, that was a lot of money then. I mean, it's like you have to multiply that by 10 now. That was like $3,000 each off the bat. So that night, I was having dinner with a fellow, a, a fellow putative strike breaker from England, and we were talking together about what we were doing. And over at the other side of the dining room, there was a group of physicians, and they called us over. And these were striking physicians, and they probably guessed from our accents, perhaps, that we were putative strike breakers, and then they explained to us how wrong we were and that this was a vicious government who were going to recruit um, um, doctors into a kind of martial regime in which they would be dictators and interfere with the doctor-patient relationship and do all sorts of terrible things and make sure that people who are no longer able to work would be got rid of and so on. All these very, very extreme views. And then I said, well, let me buy you a drink. They said, no, that's dirty money. And they bought us a drink. And they, of course, they failed to persuade us. So this gave me a clue as to what was forthcoming. So anyway, the next morning we were collected, put on a bus, and we started to drive from Regina to Saskatoon, a journey of about 160 miles. And I was amazed how little there was. Like, we went for miles, like if you went 160 miles in England, you'd go through about five big cities. And then we drove for miles and miles and saw nothing but cornfields, occasionally a little village with names like Elbow, Saskatchewan, or Bigger, B-I-G-G-A-I, -G -G on, on that see, The sign on Bigger said, New York is bigger, but this is bigger. But tiny villages, and then miles and miles of nothing but flat cornfields and no hills. So I felt like I was at sea in the middle of land. It was a very strange feeling. Anyway, eventually we arrived at... Um, Saskatoon, uh, the, and, and we discovered, we were told then that um, the College of Physicians had refused to give us a license. Now this was absolutely in contradiction to um, the agreement that the College of Physicians had, es had established with the British Medical Association that we would recipro reciprocally recognize each other's licenses. Uh, and so we had to seek a writ of mandamus. A writ of mandamus is mainly, comes from the Latin word mandare, mandare, the same word as mandate. 
it requests a judge to make some body or institution do what the law requires them to do. In other words, it's a request from a, to a judge to obey in order to obey the law. And we had to wait for a bit for this proceeding to take place. And so I had a little time to roam around Saskatoon and see what a sort of city this was. It was called a city, but to us it would be a, like a very large country village, about a hundred thousand population with one main street. And I began to look around and I saw a bar there. And on the window of the bar was the message, mixed drinking. I said, what does mixed drinking mean? So in order to find out, I went in and ordered a mixed drink. And they said, what do you mean, mixed drink? I said, well, this is just a mixed drinking. Oh, they said, that doesn't mean. Do you know what that was? It means that recently a law had been passed to allow men and women to drink together. Before, that had been against the laws. I thought, this is a fairly primitive society. So this was quite a recent idea that men and women could drink alcohol together. So I thought, my God. My God. And then I looked at the entertainment, and there were two cinemas. One was showing... One was showing uh, Dracula in the Dracula in the girls' dormitory, and the other one was showing King Kong meets Godzilla. So I thought, well, obviously, this this city needs a transfusion of culture. It's, it's a suffering lack of culture, and really urgently needs a transfusion, which we attended to, as we'll see later. That need we attended to. So. Eventually, we got our license and uh, it was time to go to work. And I had heard that there was a community clinic being planned in the center of Saskatoon. And I wanted to go there because I didn't want to, 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 to work in the country. I wanted to work in a city where there would be specialists. Well, for one thing, I'm, I'm, I'm an irremediably urban person. I'm not a rural person. And secondly, in the city, you have specialists you can refer people to. So there I met Sam Wolfe, who, uh, who was a professor of public health at the University of Saskatoon. And he was gathering some physicians together to form a community clinic to work while the strike was going on. In other words, these were Canadian, one English one, but Canadian physicians who had decided to break the strike. And I have to say something here about motivation and about the sort of people that are involved here. Now, the College of Physicians and the KO the KO, the Keep Our Doctors Association, called us mercenary communists, right? Mercenary communists. And it's a sort of strange contradiction in that term. In my own case, you could say there was some truth in this, because I was very left-wing left socialist. I was very committed to the idea of government-paid single-payer health care, because I thought this was the best way to meet everybody's needs. And I had made speeches in England in favor of Beveridge's health care plan in England, of course, which was now underway. And also, I had at one time almost thought of joining the Communist Party, although I never did. And also, I was a mercenary in the following sense. Now, I went there thoroughly believing in the cause, and, and, and then I made speeches, and, but also there were other considerations. In Saskatchewan, I was going to be paid three times what I was going to be paid in England, and the, the pay I was going to get in in um, Canada was uh, one thousand eight hundred, no, one thousand five hundred dollars a month. Five, in other words, five hundred pounds 
a month. And I was being paid a third of that in England. Secondly, life was very dreary in England, you know, and I was also having a bit of a row with my father. And, uh, you know, this was free travel to a new country, and um, things were not rationed in Canada, you know. In England, you could only have one bar of chocolate a month, and there, food as much as you wanted. So, I mean, to that extent, I was a mercenary because there were financial and other benefits. And of course, this is the other thing, there is no pleasure in youth equivalent to combating your elders and betters in the name of a cause, right? To fight your elders and betters in the name of a cause is a delightful experience for any young person. So there were a lot of considerations other than my belief in the cause, which you could say formed the body of my motivation. Freud once said that, mot that, that, that motives are overdetermined, and it was certainly true in my case. But the real heroes were the Canadian doctors who came in because they sacrificed all their professional contacts in a moment. I mean, the fact that the Saskatchewan doctors hated me didn't matter because I never knew them anyway. But the Canadian doctors who went on strike were the real heroes. They gave up their benefits. For instance, among the group that we found the community clinic was Mel Langer. He was the surgeon. He was an outstanding surgeon. And he was a Marxist. I mean, he was a thoroughgoing, fanatical Marxist. But in character, he was cherubic. He had a cherubic smile. He was very gentle. So his social manners conflicted with his very aggressive ideology. But he undertook to work for a very small salary and give the rest, because he could earn a fortune as a surgeon in Saskatchewan. He uh, undertook to work for a very small salary and give the rest towards the clinic. You see, so he wasn't a mercenary at all. May have been a communist, but not a mercenary. And then Sam Wolf, who was directing the clinic, who was in many ways an unpleasant, an unpleasant man, he had a tenured professorship in public health and university, and he gave that up and gave up all his professional associations to come and direct our clinic. So they were the real heroes. So, meanwhile, I turned my attention to remedying the lack of culture, this business of tra cultural transfusion that I talked about. So, in collaboration with uh, two of my colleagues, we opened a coffee house, and we call it the Louis Riel the Louis Riel Coffee House. It had pre previously been the Peppermint Lounge, and we converted, we hired an, an artist to um, paint, do some murals. We had the place painted up. And then we had um, debates on Cuba. We had chess matches. After I'd seen my patients, I would go and play the piano for the customers for a little while. And we had folk singers. And um, one of the waiters, well, they had folk singers and quite famous folk singers singing. And we had cues around the block. It was wildly successful. Although the manager cheated us by stealing an amount of money from us. That's another story. And then one of our waiters, his name was um, uh, Joni Anderson, came up to me and said, I'd like, to, I'd like to try out as one of your singers. I said, uh, well, OK, I tell you what, I'll get two of my partners together, and we'll, we'll do an audition, and we'll see how good you are. So I got my two partners to come and say, one of our waitresses wants to audition. They said, OK. So she sang a couple of songs, and the other two said, ah, oh, forget about it. 
And I said, well, I'm interested in music. I said, I think she has something. And also she has, as well as I think her singing is interesting, her inter interpretation of the song has a musical understanding of the song, but also she has something of that indefinable thing called stage presence. So I say, we give her a go. So the other two said, well, okay, if you think it's okay, okay with us. So we said, okay, you're hired. So she sang for a week. It's not my kind of music, but she was very, very popular. She, they loved her, and she went on for another week. We held her on for another week, and then she went off somewhere else. And I forgot, forgot all about her and never heard about her again. Never heard anything of her until 30 years later. And 30 years later, somebody sent me a book. And the name of the book was Girls Like Us, and it was a biography of three different singers, one of whom was a woman called Joni, uh, uh, Joni Mitchell. Well, I'd never heard of Joni Mitchell. I didn't know who she was. And I wondered why they'd sent me this book. But at the beginning, they pointed out, read page so-and-so. So I read page so-and-so. And there was this account Written by, Joni, written by Joni Anderson of how I had interviewed her. She, she described me as a man with an Oxford accent, Ren Gold, she gave my name, described as a man of, with an Oxford accent. Actually, I went to Cambridge anyway, and as having a, a um, powder blue Jaguar, which was true, and that um, I had sponsored her, whereas the other two had disagreed. So this was the story story of um, Joni, somebody who'd apparently become Joni Mitchell, presumably by marriage, I thought, who'd apparently become famous, although I'd never heard of her, because I don't listen to that kind of music, you see. So I thought, that's funny, I gave her a start. Famous person, her start. Although I wasn't fooling myself, I was quite sure that her talent would have got her a start somewhere else if it hadn't been myself, who happened to be the first to hear her. So I thought, well, I'll get hold of her, try and get hold of her and tell her this is the person who gave you his start. And I phoned her agents, but I never got through to her. They probably thought that I was some crank trying to get hold of her. So I've never managed to reestablish contact. Contact. But anyway, that's my story of giving Joni Mitchell a start. And meanwhile, the, 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 the restaurant was a great success. Two or three weeks after the beginning of the strike, Lord Taylor, a healthcare expert, was summoned from England and began negotiating between the government and the College of Physicians. And eventually they arrived at a settlement whereby the doctors would run their own insurance company and the government would have their Medicare system, and a doctor could be free to work under either. It came to the same thing as Medicare, but it satisfied everybody, and eventually an agreement was reached, and everybody went back to work. So my re the, the raison d'etre for my original travel to Canada had now ended, but I decided to stay on anyway. I was very happy working with my colleagues, even though we were still black sheep. With respect to the rest of the medical group, we were still black sheep, but I enjoyed the company of my colleagues. The conditions were much better than in England. I enjoyed the um, enterprise, and we, I decided to stay on with the community clinic and um, continue with the practice. It was a very, very rewarding experience. And the sort of people we came, the sort of people who came to see us were dedicated to the spirit of government funding and they, we were sort of political allies. And it was a very, very odd thing to, to experience. When I first started practicing there, 
people came with all sorts of stories, like very implausible stories about what their doctors had told them. Like one patient told me that his doctor had told him he had a hole in his stomach and there was medicine was going to provide glue to fill up the hole. So I thought, this is a very unlikely story. I thought, the doctors around here must be crazy. So I did a controlled experiment. I started telling patients things and made it a note of what I told them. And then I asked them next week what I told them. And what they told me I told them was just as crazy as what they told me the other doctors had told them. So it became clear to me this was not the doctors who were crazy, but an inaccurate interpretation on the part of the patients. Remember, I was quite new to general practice, so not only was the country new to me, general practice was really quite new to me too. And so, the sort of patient who came was a very dedicated patient to the cause. There was one guy came in, he had dirty, dirty boots, ragged trousers, and uh, unshaven, and he had a gallbladder problem. And I almost felt like I should give him his bus fare home or help him with some money or something. As he left the clinic, he left a check for $10,000. It turned out that this guy was a farmer. These farmers don't bother to dress up, but they're really very rich. Some of them own a square mile, four sections, a square mile, or maybe several square miles of land. And as I got to know them, I used to go out and visit them on, on their farms. It was a marvelous experience, and they would drive me around on their tractor and show me the cows and the, everything. And I once said to one of the farmers, he gave me his sort of budget, what it costs to run the farm and so on. It's a very, very precarious life. You can lose a lot of money if the harvest doesn't go well or the, or the weather isn't good. It's very risky. I said to this farmer, you know, if you sold the farm and bought government bonds, you could sit in your chair, do nothing and get a better income and you're getting from your farm. He's, and I thought this would be a revolution, revelation to him. He said, oh, I realize that. I realize that. But listen, I like things grow. I like to see things grow. And that's why I farm. It isn't so much the money. And it was true. They were dedicated to the land. And they loved the land. And they loved growing things. And they did it for the same reason that an artist paints paintings, you know. And that was wonderful to see. In the winter, the practice when the winter came and I had to do house calls, that was tough because it was 40 below. And when it goes to 40 below, the tires get, you know, when the tire is on the ground, that part of the tire is flattened. And that flatness in minus 40 remains so that for the first mile or two you drive, it's a bumpy ride because that flattened part of the tire takes time to unflatten with the warmth of the driving. And we used to go out in minus 40 to do house calls, and that was tough. But it was rewarding. We'd go and see the patients, and you know, they'd give us a cup of coffee, and we'd look after. It was usually minor things like a cold or maybe. Um, lung infection, you had to give some antibiotics and we had medicine with us and so on. Then we, the, 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 the director of the clinic, as I told you, was a, had been a professor of public health, so he knew about public health and he decided to do some research in public health and recruited us to help him. And we started looking at things like what medicines we used. For instance, we found out, we, we, we made a record of all the medicines we used for each patient. And we discovered that by, that, that let's say, 25% 20, of our patients could be treated with only 12 medications. 
and then another 12 would look after another 25 percent. So we could look after 50 percent of our patients with only 25 different medications. And if we bulk bought those medications, we could save a tremendous amount of money. We also started looking into how we used our time, and we discovered that if we had used, recruited social workers and nurses and nurses' aides, we could do with far less general practitioners, expensive general practitioners, and in fact, run the clinic with much less expense to the government. And we we tried to we we, we tried to get um, the government to give us a global budget. In other words, give us an overall budget that we could work in, rather than billing the government for each service. But they refused to do that for two reasons: a good reason and a bad reason. The bad reason was they didn't want to seem to be partisan to one side of the previous dispute by backing, backing us. And secondly, to give you a, blo a global budget, you'd have to define the population that we were looking after, and that's very difficult to do. Anyway, we published our findings in a book um, sponsored by the Millbank Foundation, and it's still in print. It's called The Family Doctor, written by Badgley and Wolf, the principal investigators in this enterprise. And I learned a lot from that, a lot about public health. And um, it was a, a very valuable experience. Meanwhile, we were trying to get hospital privileges. In other words, we got our license. That was fine. but. We weren't automatically entitled to hospital privileges, which were not automatically uh, a consequence of our reciprocal agreement with the British Medical Association. So the hospital had to grant us that independently, and they refused to give us, give us. the um, rancor of the previous dispute still lingered. So, and this, I was denied hospital privileges, and many, in fact, most of the doctors who had been on strike, who had worked during the strike, were denied them. So we um, applied for a um, royal commission to investigate this, and. Uh, a royal commissioner was appointed, Justice Woods was appointed, and the royal commission was constituted. And my, law my lawyer for this royal commission was George Taylor, a very, f a very distinguished lawyer in Saskatchewan, and his, his uh, clerk, his legal clerk, was a guy called Roy Romanoff, and Roy Romanoff eventually became the premier of Saskatchewan. But he was then a humble um, legal clerk, uh, in intrigued by the whole drama of this royal commission. So anyway, I gave evidence for two days in front of the royal commission. It was all reported in the local paper, the Star Phoenix, which we called the Star Peanuts. So uh, George Taylor examined me, cross-examined me in my, my training, and then the head of the city hospital, who had denied me privileges, gave evidence. And he gave evidence that my training was a dog's breakfast. I was, had a Cambridge degree in medicine. Right? He, he said that my training was a dog's breakfast and that my training had not fitted me to practice prairie medicine, right? And we s subpoenaed the files of the, of the uh, Saskatchewan College of Physicians, and we discovered that previous doctors had been given hospital privileges merely on a letter from their previous headmaster that they'd been of good character, right? But I had, I'd had several uh, letters of recommendation from doctors in England. 
And so it was pretty clear, well, Justice Woods ruled, and I'm paraphrasing his words, I'm not sure I remember his exact words, and the gist of what he said was that, that um, Dr. Gold had reason to believe that political considerations may have entered into the decision to deny him hospital privileges, and he ordered a reappraisal of my status. And this reappraisal was done, and we granted hospital privileges. So that was one drama. And then we started practicing in the hospital. And when we went into the hospital common room, for the doctor's common room, all the doctors would leave immediately and leave us to ourselves. The previous strike breakers to, uh, to, in, to isolation, right? And the cleaner used to come in and say, I'm so glad when you people come because it gives me a chance to, to clean out the room. Any, anyway, the rancor of the strike and the strike breaking lingered for a long, long time. But eventually, things came to a more peaceful conclusion. And I think all that rancor has now dissipated and um, everybody accepts now Medicare. In fact, the doctors would be appalled now if it was uh, removed. So now, let's talk for a minute about the motives of the doctors who were against Medicare. They said, it's not the money. And when anybody said, it's not the money, it's the money. So there was money involved. They were afraid that the, that the state would control their money. But to be fair, it wasn't just money. They felt that the doctor-patient, they had a sort of co view of medicine really is a cottage industry where the relationship between the doctor and the patient was something sacred between them in which nobody else, let alone a government, should be allowed to intrude. Intrude. This, in my view, is a very wrong, wrong view of medicine. And medicine has to be a communal thing because it's a war on disease and it has to have a military kind of organization, which the government really has to be involved. However, this was not the doctor's view. And I want to put it to you this way. Clemenceau, the, the um, president of France during the First World War, once famously, famously said that uh, war is too seriously a matter too serious a matter to be left to the generals. And I would say, in a similar vein, medicine is too serious a matter to be left to the doctors. Because while doctors are tra trained and are capable, with very widely range of competence to look after individual patients and individual illnesses, they are not equipped to look at health as a communal venture where the health of one person affects the health of another. For instance, the, the treatment of infectious diseases is a communal matter. The elimination of, commun of, 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 of infectious diseases cannot be held, handled by one doctor seeing a patient at a time. It has to be like a military enterprise coordinated by the government, which, by the way, also has done it very poorly. So you need a government, a government logistic overseeing and organization of the principle of, 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 of medical care. And you also need a way of sharing the burden uh, through a single payer. So one, in the next one of these chapters, I'm going to give a talk on rethinking our medical system. Rethinking our system of medical care. 
this is something we really have to do cut